Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is virtual nuclear deterrence. This is getting at the idea that one can use the threat to build nuclear weapons, perhaps almost as well as actually having nuclear weapons, in terms of interstate coercion. Let's get to it. Last time, we focused on the theoretical logic behind nuclear negotiations. We started by reasoning about what would happen in the event that the potential proliferator had a nuclear arsenal. Well, at that point, it could leverage the threat to use nuclear weapons against the opponent. Recognizing this, the opponent would have an incentive to strike a deal that reflects the newfound balance of power. In other words, it recognizes that the potential proliferator is stronger now that it has nuclear weapons, and it creates a deal that reflects that balance of power. But we also discovered that the opponent can do better for itself than allow the potential proliferator to acquire nuclear weapons. Those nuclear weapons are costly, and because of that cost, the deal that's going to be implemented pre-nuclear weapons is going to be relatively similar to what we observe in a world post-nuclear weapons, provided that the cost of those weapons is cheap. As that cost of nuclear weapons goes up and up, the opponent can leverage the fact that the potential proliferator has a less attractive nuclear option. And so as that cost of weapons increases, the distribution of the policy in dispute is going to more favorably land on the opponent's side than the proliferator's side. And that just keeps going. However, we also discovered that if the cost of nuclear weapons is sufficiently high, the potential proliferator would have no interest in building them. The cost of the investment simply is not worth the ultimate benefit. In those situations, the potential proliferator has no credible threat to build weapons, and in turn, the opponent is not going to offer concessions based off of that. If there is no threat there, then the opponent has no reason to give any concession. And as a result, if we increase the cost of nuclear weapons after some point, the settlement that's going to be implemented is going to remain the same. Again, that's because the opponent is no longer basing the terms of the settlement off the proliferator's ability to produce nuclear weapons, because the potential proliferator will never go down that route. Moving back a few steps, we can get an appreciation for why a potential proliferator with very low costs of nuclear weapons is said to have a virtual nuclear deterrent. For the opponent to convince the potential proliferator not to build, it essentially needs to be offering a deal that almost exactly matches what it would receive in a post-proliferation deal, where the potential proliferator has a fully realized nuclear deterrent. The opponent can extract something, but it's a very minute amount because the potential proliferator's cost is so low. And as a result, we might say that the potential proliferator here is exercising a virtual nuclear deterrent. It doesn't actually have the nuclear weapons, but it's almost getting the full benefit out of it simply because it's very easy for the potential proliferator to acquire nuclear weapons. So that's the theory. What happens in practice? Well, to answer that question, we first need some sort of measurement on how easy it is for a country to build nuclear weapons. Fortunately, we've already talked about just such a measurement. One thing that you can do to estimate the latent ability for a country to produce nuclear weapons is to look at all of the observable things that they do that are related to the production of nuclear weapons and then aggregate them together. And once you do that, well, you have a measurement. And this is what that measurement looks like in 2001, with countries in darker red having higher abilities to produce nuclear weapons. Of course, this is meaning that the countries that actually have produced nuclear weapons are the reddest of the countries, whereas the countries in white and light yellow are the countries that have the least ability to produce nuclear weapons. I take that measurement, and in chapter 4 of Bargaining Over the Bomb, I conduct the following statistical test. The independent variable of interest is nuclear capacity, estimated in the manner that I just described. All we're trying to get at there is how easily a state can produce nuclear technology. The dependent variable is reciprocation of disputes. In the study of international relations, we have a data set on what's called a militarized interstate dispute. These are all the situations that we have on record where one state makes some sort of threat 
or take some sort of provocative action against an opposing country. Notably, it does not actually have to devolve into violence for the situation to make the militarized interstate dispute data set. That's important here because we're caring a lot about coercion. And we might see situations where a state has the ability to produce nuclear weapons, makes a threat to an opposing state, and then watches the opposing state back down. Like most statistical models, there are also control variables here. Things like how much money the country has, and how big its conventional military army is. Having those controls is important because it's reasonable to think that nuclear capacity correlates with those, and reciprocation of disputes also correlates with them. So if we want to isolate the relationship between nuclear capacity and the reciprocation of disputes, we need to include those control variables. I'm not talking about them here in too much depth, though, because our main interest is in that dependent variable and that independent variable. And with all of that out of the way, the expectation is that greater nuclear capacity will correlate with lower rates of reciprocation. The idea being here that if I have greater nuclear capacity, it's easier for me to construct nuclear weapons. And so when I initiate a dispute against you, because you are viewing the threat of me building nuclear weapons as a more present reality, you are going to be more inclined to let the threat go and not try to reciprocate or escalate the situation. Here's what the estimate looks like. On our horizontal axis, we have nuclear proficiency. So on the far left, we have the most incompetent countries. And on the far right, we have the most competent countries. And each little hash mark there is representing one country that is in the model that we're estimating. There's no need to interpret what each of those numbers means for nuclear proficiency because this is a relative rating. We're just trying to measure how much better, relatively speaking, two countries are. And so negative one, zero, and one doesn't have a real interpretation. It's just a relative ranking. On the vertical axis, we have the estimated probability of reciprocation. As the state that is starting the dispute, you prefer a lower probability of reciprocation than a higher probability of reciprocation. Sure enough, we have the anticipated relationship. Take a look at the solid line. It's going down. That's reflecting how in the data, countries with the lowest amount of proficiency are having their reciprocation rates higher than countries with the greatest amounts of proficiency. Just eyeballing it, it appears that the least proficient countries have their disputes reciprocated about 67% of the time, whereas countries that have the greatest degree of proficiency are having their rates of reciprocation drop all the way to about 44 or 43% of the time. The last two things on this figure are those dashed lines. This is reflecting how the estimate here is just that. It's not precision. We don't know for sure exactly what the reciprocation rates look like. There's some degree of uncertainty there, and the dashed lines are measuring that uncertainty. So we have upper and lower bounds for any given level of nuclear proficiency on what we think this relationship looks like. One thing that doesn't show up in that figure is what happens if you include the presence of realized nuclear weapons in the statistical model. Our theoretical prediction is that it shouldn't make very much of a difference as compared to a situation where a country has high degrees of proficiency and thus low costs of weapons. Those deals look very similar. And in fact, the statistical model recovers this. If you look at the relationship between realized nuclear weapons and dispute reciprocation, we see that there is a negative relationship there. That is, having nuclear weapons predicts a lower rate of reciprocation. But the substantive effect is very small, and that's consistent with the theory. If you have a high degree of proficiency, then the difference between that and actually having a nuclear weapon is fairly negligible, and the statistical model is capturing that. We can do one more thing with the statistical model to provide more evidence for the theory at play. Remember that if the cost of weapons is very high, it doesn't matter exactly how high they are. The difference between super expensive weapons and extremely expensive weapons is irrelevant. That's because in either of those cases, the country cannot credibly threaten to build nuclear weapons, and so the opponent is basing no concessions off of that. Translating that into the statistical model, 
the expectation would be that if you have a very low degree of proficiency, that the estimated rate of reciprocation should be high and relatively flat. That's because the exact amount of proficiency doesn't matter in those cases. As you start getting a higher degree of proficiency, and thus a lower cost of weapons, we should start seeing a negative relationship there, where having a higher degree of proficiency is predicting a lower rate of dispute reciprocation. And if you give the estimation procedure just a little bit more flexibility, we're seeing that exact relationship. On the left half of this figure, where we have low proficiency, we're seeing proficiency basically have no relationship with the probability of reciprocation. It's only when you get to high degrees of proficiency that we start observing that drop off. You will notice that there's a little bit of a change going on on the left-hand side, but that's because the estimation procedure here is trying to essentially estimate an upside down U. So there's always going to be some curvature there, but there's no reason to overinterpret that. This is exactly what one would expect to see given the hypothesis that I just described. In conclusion, we're seeing the ability to produce nuclear weapons as having a relationship with policy outcomes, consistent with what the theory of nuclear negotiations would predict. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.